Yeah, but are we ready to go? Not yet. Okay, it's just let me waiting for you waiting for YouTube to Okay. Gary's gonna kick it off, Deb, and then we'll go from okay. there. Alrighty, we're ready to roll. Um, I'd like to convene this uh, public hearing of the Judiciary Committee. Uh, we are uh, going to be in Roman numeral number one, uh, nominations for review. We'll start with the Honorable Andrew McDonald of Hartford. Is Judge McDonald on? Deb, is he? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking. See it. That's it. We got a lot of judges here. He is not on. Okay. Um, I have to switch. Who's next on the, the agenda? Um, next on the agenda. Um, the Honorable Peter L. Brown of Camden. Next uh, on the agenda, we'll go back to Judge McDonald, if he's not here still. I was trying to stall for some, for some time. Uh, we'll go to the Honorable Peter Brown. Uh, is Judge Brown on? Yes, I have the oath, um, Gary? Yeah, I, ha I have the oath. Okay. Judge Brown, you're on? Yes, sir. Okay, um, give me a second to pull up the oath. All right, so if you please raise your right hand um, and the oath is as follows. Do you swear or affirm as the case may be that the information you will provide to this committee will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth so help you God under penalty of perjury? Yes, I do. Okay, you may make your opening statement. Thank you, Senator, and good morning. Senator Winfield, Representative Sastrom, Senator Kissel, Representative Fishbein, and distinguished members of the Judiciary Committee. First of all, I would like to thank Governor Lamont for nominating me to serve another term as a Superior Court judge. And I also want to thank you for the opportunity to appear before you this morning. Needless to say, the last 10 months have been a tremendous challenge for all of us. It has been an honor and a privilege to serve the people of this great state in the judiciary, and it would be my honor and privilege to serve another eight-year term if permitted to do so. Now, I know the committee has my questionnaire and biographical information, but let me just indicate a few things to you briefly. I have served on the bench since 2004. I've been assigned to courts in Waterbury, New Haven, Derby, and most recently, Milford, where I am the administrative judge for the Ansonia Milford Judicial District and the presiding judge for the criminal division. My assignments have been primarily to the criminal and juvenile divisions, but I've also presided over civil and family matters as well. I wanna take this opportunity to thank my loving wife, Kathleen, and my sons, Jordan and Marcus, for all, the, all their love and support over the years. And again, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you, and I'm prepared to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Judge. And um, the members of the committee, if you have a question, I will remind you that the easiest way for us to make those happen is for you to use the uh, raise your hand function so that we may call on you in the order those hands go up. Um, are there any questions from members of the committee? Uh, Representative uh, Fishbein. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And, and good morning, Judge Brown. Um, good morning. In reviewing your backup, I, I don't have really any questions with regard to your qualifications. I just want to, you know, in this, this new world of the pandemic and you having a vast uh, experience in our court process, what is the most challenging part that you found uh, being a judge in the pandemic? Thank you, that's an excellent question, Representative Fishbein, I appreciate it. I think the most challenging aspect uh, for me uh, has been um, from a technical aspect, learning to utilize 
the various um, virtual platforms that have been made available to us by uh, judicial so that we can interact remotely uh, with the public. Uh, I mean, for example, it's been a tradition for many years to do pre-trials in the courthouse, in the judges' chambers. That's sort of a traditional thing that's happened, criminal, civil, family, juvenile, what have you. Uh, that's all changed now. We have learned how to use the virtual platform to do our pre-trial proceedings all remotely. And, and frankly, I've been doing that now. All of us have been doing that, I think, probably since uh, March and April of, of, of last year going forward. So that's been a challenge. Uh, it, it's, it's also uh, been a challenge watching the public, uh, for those that are still coming to court on some matters, uh, understanding their feeling and frustration with having to work through the protocols to wear the mask. Now, I'm learning to wear the mask in the courtroom every day, obviously, uh, in the halls, doing the distancing. So it, 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 it's been a learning process for everyone. But I have to say I'm immensely uh, proud of the uh, employees and staff here, of the public. Everyone has been willing to cooperate to try to get the job done. Um, and, and trying to meet our number one goal, which is to keep everybody safe, while at the same time doing the same level of work and moving the business. So I think those have been the dual challenges. Well, I thank you for that. The pre-trials that you're conducting, those are on the record? No, the, these are pre-trials that we normally have, uh, you know, a judicial pre-trials in chambers. So those normally are not on the record. Uh, unless the individual is a pro se, but for the most part, those are not on the record. For those cases uh, that are going to be resolved, we are finding more and more that we are able to do those remotely as well. Uh, but there are times when counsel uh, would request to, to have a sentencing uh, done in the courthouse, and we can find ways to get that done as well. And that's with regard to criminal matters, but um, civil matters, particularly in your courthouse, um, you know, it's my, been my experience because I'm in some court just about every day um, that where in the past we could say to the clerk, we'd like to speak to the judge in chambers for a moment, you know, they can't do that anymore. And that proceedings um, are recorded in some way, shape or form. Is that your experience as well? Yeah, the civil matters and the family matters are almost entirely now uh, being done uh, remotely. And if the parties obviously reach an agreement, then they can even do those remotely and, and have the uh, proceedings memorialized uh, on the record leading to an agreement. So for the vast majority of family and civil matters, those are all being done remotely. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Judge, and thank you for your service. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to ask questions. Uh, thank you, Senator Fishbein. Senator Brown. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to ask Judge Brown questions. Um, I'd like to preface my remarks by saying that I've had the honor um, to be in front of him as an attorney uh, prior to uh, serving as a state senator. And uh, it's a unique perspective, as um, uh, uh, Representative Fishbein was saying, and you have an ability to practice law and, and encounter judges uh, taking off the position of a senator and just kind of see the interactions of how people comport themselves. And I can just say that uh, Judge Brown is a person that we, we should uh, be thankful to, to serve in the capacity of, of a judge in this great state. Um, he's a person who has a decorum and the temperament uh, to be a judge. When, whenever having a supervised pretrial, uh, my experience with him has always been a, a judge who's willing to hear both sides who holds the state accountable on their burden of proof of, of, of presenting the evidence required. Uh, and, and, and most importantly, a, a fact that's near and dear to my heart when determining bond on, on people does not use it in a punitive fashion or does not use it in a way to uh, further punish folks, but rather as it's a, it was intended by this legislature. So I, I am um, I'm honored and I support his uh, renomination and I appreciate his service on the bench. And he's a real gem. And I'll, I'll tell you one last bit, if I, I may, Mr. Chair, uh, as, we, as we look further for promotions, I know we've recently appointed folks to the appellate court level. Uh, this is a person here who's so respected and when he makes a termination that I think that well, we miss opportunities we don't, when we don't elevate people like this because um, having people like him serve in the higher capacity 
uh, it ensures that those who are in the superior court capacity do what they're, what they're intended to do and to uphold the law. So a strong endorsement of Judge Brown. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Senator. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Bradley. Uh, are there others? I don't see any hands raised. I'll give you a second before I close us out here. Okay, well, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Uh, we will, uh, seeing no further questions, we will uh, move to the next uh, person up for appointment, uh, which will be uh, for uh, uh, reappointment to, to the Superior Court. Shelley Marcus of New Haven uh, is Judge Marcus here. I can't see. I am here. Okay. Here I am. <laughs> uh, great. Good morning. Uh, and then, and then I'll circle back to see if uh, Justice, uh, if Judge uh, McDonald's here. Uh, would you raise your right hand? Yes, sir. Uh, do you do you swear or affirm, as the case may be, that the information you provide to this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So I'll help you, God, or under penalty of perjury. I do. Uh, you may make your statement. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, Senator Winfield, Representative Stastrom, Senator Kissel, Representative Fishbein, Senator Kasser, uh, Representative Blumenthal, and members of the Judiciary Committee. I want to thank you first for uh, taking the time to meet with me today. I'd also like to thank uh, Governor Lamont for nominating me to a second term as judge of the Superior Court. Uh, it has truly been an honor and a privilege to represent the citizens of Connecticut for the past eight years. My first assignment was in Middletown where I had a block assignment. I sat primarily in the GA four days a week uh, and I was also as the GA judge, I was the housing judge there. In addition, I set civil short calendar foreclosures and family overflow on alternating Mondays. Uh, juvenile was about the only discipline that I was not exposed to in Middletown. But when it came time to make a change in assignments, I requested to be assigned to juvenile as uh, that's always been an interest of mine. I was assigned to New Haven Juvenile in May of 2014 and have remained here to the present time becoming presiding judge in September of 2015. Uh, I've made uh, contributions to the community we serve by uh, participating in a number of uh, panel discussions in front of a fatherhood engagement uh, workshop panel in New Haven, uh, reading to children in a number of schools as part of Read Across America and serving as a guest speaker uh, on numerous occasions for a juvenile justice class at Quinnipiac University. I am also on the Judges Education Committee, having been appointed by Judge Carroll in 2018. I would be most grateful for the opportunity to serve another term and for your approval of my renomination. I'd like to thank you again, and I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you uh, very much for joining us this morning. I will check to see if there are any questions. Uh, Representative Porter. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, good morning, Your Honor. Congratulations on your uh, renomination. Um, you said when they on the questionnaire, what areas of law do you enjoy most? You said you enjoy all aspects of juvenile law. Could you just give me one specific example and how you feel um, your your capacity has served juveniles in the juvenile uh, criminal justice system? So, so I'm sorry. So you're asking about the criminal justice system or all aspects, Representative? The specifically juvenile justice system, yeah. and how you feel you've been able to impact that system in a way that um is is tangible and matters. I think that the the most um, rewarding part uh, of this job are uh, the times that uh, you're successful uh, in helping children um, engage and uh, stay away from the criminal justice system, the juvenile justice system. Um, that's what we're that's what we're all about is treating the needs of these children um, so that they can stay out of the juvenile justice system. Uh, and for us, that's uh, helping to implement all the programs and services. 
um, whether they be putting a child if they need uh, some mental health treatment, uh, whether it would be uh, providing them with a mentor to help them uh, in all aspects of life uh, and turning them uh, into uh, productive uh, young people that they can be and having them be successes uh, in life. Uh, and uh, it's very rewarding to be a part of that process. Thank, thank you for that answer. And um, just one last uh, question through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, with the uptick we're seeing in, um, you know, the, the, the crimes along the lines of stolen cars and uh, what, what would you have to say to that? What have you seen in your capacity as a judge in the juvenile system? Um, and what can you tell us you feel needs to be done that would be proactive and effective in a way of addressing this, this critical issue? Uh, that, thank you for that question, Representative Porter. I'm sure uh, everybody's read the news and everybody uh, is aware of, of these issues. While this problem with the stolen cars existed prior to the pro, uh, COVID pandemic, there's, I'm sure everybody's seen it and it's in the media, there's been a definite uptick since the COVID shutdowns of last March. And not that it should make all of us feel any better, um, but this problem is not confined to Connecticut. This is a nationwide issue. Um, children need consistency, they need structure, and they need pro-social activities. Uh, I'm sure as everybody knows, as of, as of last spring, all schools were remote. Now some schools have gone back, but some schools are still are in remote learning. Um, some have gone to some sort of full-time or a, some sort of hybrid structure. As a result of that disruption in schedules, there's been a disruption in everybody's daily routine. Um, organized activities have been put on hold, pause. Um, organized sports have been put on, on hold and pause. Um, and so there's been a, a, a total um, disruption to that structure and consistency um, that children need. Kids have a lot of time time on their hands and some are engaging in these activities. Um, fr from our perspective, we're doing the best that we can in the co this context um, to uh, address um, the needs of these children as well as address public safety. Um, in terms of, of what needs to be done, um, I'm going to leave that to uh, the legislature uh, for you to consider um, and debate. As I'm sure everybody knows, I don't know whether uh, Representative Walker uh, is with us, but she co-chairs the uh, JPOC, Juvenile Justice uh, Policy and Oversight Committee. And I'm sure they'll be talking about these issues and, and making some suggestions. Uh, thank you for that response, and I do serve as a member on JPOC as well, and we <laughs> certainly will. I uh, was just really interested in hearing um, a response from your side um, of the issue, but I do thank you for your time. Um, I do congratulate you on your reappointment nomination, and I wish you all the best, Judge Marcus. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thank you, Representative uh, Thank you. Uh, Representative Fishbein. Good morning. Um, your Honor, how are you? Good morning. I'm fine. How are you? Very good. Thank you. So I just wanted to um, just take off on where we just were with this discussion. What is presently the process when um, a youth is arrested with a stolen car? So... It depends. The process would be if they are arrested and the police officer does not uh, request an order from a judge for a take into custody uh, to be detained or to be detained, uh, then that child is uh, given a summons and they uh, come into court uh, and uh, there is an arraignment uh, and uh, Everybody has counsel, and then the process goes from there. So the scenario being um, child is arrested at 2 o'clock in the morning. Is court open for those proceedings? How does that work? So, so again, if the child is just given a summons to, to appear, um, a date and time 
during the ordinary course of business will be given to that child. Their parent signs off on the summons, their parent uh, or guardian is contacted and they sign off on the uh, summons uh, and they're given a regular court date. If on the other hand, the police officer believes that it's serious enough, whatever the activity was, um, to warrant a request to take that, that child to have them be uh, detained on a, on a pretrial basis, uh, then uh, the police officer would contact a judge, even if it's at two o'clock in the morning, and a judge would read over the paper uh, work and make a decision as to whether they were going to sign off on, on an order to detain that child or not. And is a judge assigned to receive that call? I mean, does, I'm just trying to figure out how does the officer know? Because I hear from police officers, we want to detain these children. And I'm trying to get to the where the problem exists. Is it that somebody's not available, they're not answering the phone, nobody's assigned? You know, how do we link these two up together? There, for each judicial district, there are judges assigned, uh, and uh, I know I'm assigned, even though I, I live in the New Haven area, um, for probable cause or warrants, et, et cetera, I'm assigned to the uh, Ansonia Milford Judicial District for that part of my job. Um, so we have, um, any time a, a police officer would wanna call me, even if it's at two o'clock in the morning from that judicial district, pick up the phone and, and call. Um, I can tell you, I always answer my phone. And I, I guess, is there a particular form? Uh, you know, I, I know arrest warrants are sometimes signed in the middle of the night for whatever reason. Um, is there a particular form that's directed to this request to hold or is it merely Here. an oral? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Was it merely an oral? I'm just trying to figure out the process here. No, there's a form. There's there's a, a uh, I don't can't tell you off the top of my head the number, but it should be on there. It's a it's a J, JDM form. They all the police departments should have it. And in your experience as a judge, um, have you ever had the opportunity to sign off on one of these requests to hold? I believe that I have. Yes. Okay. And I don't know if it's two o'clock in the morning, but but I believe that I have. Do you know about how many times? Me in particular, how many yes. times? I wouldn't even begin. I wouldn't even begin to guess. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out. You know, we've established a process. How much is used in your particular experience? Would you say it's more than a handful? I would say that it's more, not in the middle of the night, no, but I would say it's more than a handful, yes. And have you ever uh, declined to sign off on one of those requests? I have, yes. Okay. Can you tell, tell us why you would, if the officer believes that the individual, the youth should be held, why in whatever occasion you can recall you would not sign off on that. Well, it depends on so so. There there are two different um, scenarios where we'd be have a, have such a request. Um, one might be where the police officer didn't make that decision, um, and we're actually in the courthouse, and maybe the prosecutor asks for an order to detain. And then you have, and I think you're asking about an on-site arrest, correct? Where um, we haven't been to the courthouse yet. I'm asking for any scenario. Um, any scenario, okay. If you want to deal so, with them so, separately, that's fine. Okay, so let's deal, so, so I'll go back to the police officer in the middle of the night scenario. Let's deal with the police officer didn't make that decision, right? And the, the, the mm -hmm. child and counsel were all in, in uh, the courthouse, and it's the first day that the child's in on, on that particular charge, um, and the prosecutor makes a request. Um, statutes um, have us consider um, only three grounds to detain a child. 
One is holding them for another jurisdiction, which you can put to one side because that's not part of this scenario. Another is if we have a, a previous failure to appear, the child's not cooperating with, with court process, which it generally doesn't pertain to this particular scenario. So then you have the third ground, which is a probable cause to believe that the child will pose a risk to public safety um, if released to the community prior, I'm sorry, and I'm, and I'm reading from the statute, prior to the court hearing or disposition, um, and that uh, child cannot be managed in a less restrictive setting. And so the court has to consider those factors and the court hears information um, perhaps the child, perhaps this is a first offense, perhaps the child um, was very, um, there were no issues in terms of the arrest of that child. They didn't try to run from the police officer. Um, there are already programs and services in place for that particular child. And so a judge makes a decision as to whether um, child can be, A, whether under whatever the scenario the judge is presented with, there is a risk to public safety and whether that risk can be managed. If there is such a risk, that can be managed in a less restrictive setting. Uh, and there are certain circumstances where a judge um, is given the discretion uh, all, we're always given the discretion to do that. And sometimes the judge says the child can't be managed in a less restrictive setting. And sometimes the judge does not um, order a detention. It totally depends on the circumstances. Um, same thing with a police officer coming to you in the middle of the night. Um, you don't have as much information under that scenario, obviously, because you're not in court, you don't have the lawyers and, and um, you have the, the uh, police report uh, and the affidavit, but again, uh, given the, the uh, allegations, um, you consider that and you weigh it um, according to the statutes and uh, a judge will make a decision uh, as to uh, whether uh, there's an order to detain or not. If a, if a judge decides in the middle of the night to detain, um, child gets presented in court uh, on the next day. Okay, and then you had said that you had recalled a particular incident when, or incident when you had um, not signed off on that. And if you could just briefly explain what happened in that case, I do not believe I do not believe that I've ever been in, interrupted uh, in the middle of the night on an order to detain. Um, I have uh, in the courthouse uh, on a number of occasions um, not detained, decided not to detain the child when there's been a request made by the prosecutor. Okay, and is there a overriding reason for um, your denial of those requests, you know, in all of these cases, this was the situation or was it various things? It's, it, again, I think, as I said before, it, there are various things. Um, we have our, our statutes um, and uh, we need to decide whether um, A, there is a risk to public safety and whether that risk cannot be managed in a less restrictive uh, setting. Um, these laws were passed based uh, on um, expert uh, information and data um, showing um, that it is uh, often not productive uh, and can be uh, harmful to lock up children, uh, which I think was the basis for uh, some of these laws being passed. With the uptick in stolen cars, however, um, legislature did add um, in 2019, um, a, uh, an addition to those statutes um, that gives us a little bit um, 
more of a definition of, of public safety. Uh, and that was Public Act 19-110. Uh, uh, and it added a subsection K, um, you, Representative Fishbein, uh, you were probably there, you're probably uh, familiar, so I'm not telling you anything uh, you don't know, but for the, re the rest of the committee, um, and that uh, judge can consider uh, that a child may be determined to pose a risk to public safety um, if the child has previously been adjudicated uh, as delinquent, um, were convicted of or pled guilty or no low contendere to two or more felony offenses uh, and has two or more prior dispositions of probation and then is charged with uh, a, uh, a stolen car. Yes, understood. All right, thank you. That's all I had. I'll open it up to my other uh, colleagues. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Thank you, Representative Fishbein. Uh, Representative Dubitsky. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Judge, for coming in today. Very much appreciate it. Um, quick question. Now, you, you, have, uh, you were first appointed to the bench in 2013. Is that correct? Correct. OK, and, and almost immediately went over to juvenile. About a year and some months later, correct. Okay. Um, over the, the last number of years, we have had, uh, I can't even tell you how many juvenile judges come through here, and virtually every one of them has had uh, in their tenure as a judge a list of complaints against them um, because I, I, I guess because juvenile just juvenile court just and family um, kind of engenders that kind of thing. Now I know that you have no complaints in the time that you uh, have uh, been a judge. And I just to ask you, what do you attribute that to that um, so many of the other judges that have come through here have had a, quite a number of complaints and um, I see that, that you don't have any. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, I just think it's really uh, important uh, not only to be uh, respectful to everyone, um, but I think the key word is, is at least for me, is, is empathy. Um, and you have um, empathy for uh, the litigants uh, that appear before you, uh, the children, uh, the parents on the child protection side. Um, you understand um, how hard uh, the, the lawyers work as well to present their, their cases. Um, and uh, I don't, you know, I, that, that's all I can say. But you know, my 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 key word is is or key words are are respect and and empathy and uh, considering the positions of, of all and um, and the hard work that everybody puts into their cases and and that's all I can attribute it to. Okay, well, thank thank you for that, and I, I'm I'm sure the uh, the the litigants and and the children before you are appreciative of that. Um, but I, I'd like to push you just a little bit more on that. What, why do you think that so many people um, believe there's a problem with the court system, um, especially in the family and juvenile courts, that we get so many complaints against judges um, for, uh, issue, for issues that, for, for in cases that come before them, um, you know, what there's, from my experience, a lot of, you know, being on the Judiciary Committee, a lot of these complaints are from pro se litigants. Where do you think there is a problem? Because I think there is one somewhere. 
we just, you know, and I think it's up to the Judiciary Committee to try to identify it and try to help resolve it. Can, have you seen a problem that you can identify and can you give us any um, insight into where you think a solution needs to be directed? I wish I could be more helpful to you, but as, as a, a juvenile judge, I have not seen it really in the juvenile courts. Our uh, litigants and parents uh, are appointed attorneys uh, if they financially qualify. So all virtually uh, all, everyone on the child protection side as well as the delinquency side uh, have counsel. So they're, they're not pro se litigants here. I've had really no experience, limited experience um, on the family side, which I think um, is where most of this is, is coming from. Um, and so I wish I could be more helpful, but I, I don't, haven't really seen that um, in, in my experience. Okay, that, fair enough. Well, I, I appreciate your time and uh, uh, good luck on your renomination. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Senator Lesser. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and congratulations, Judge Mark, on your, uh, on your renomination. Uh, it's good thank to see you here. Uh, answers this morning. Um, I just wanted to follow up a little bit on uh, some questions asked earlier by my colleague, Representative Porter. Uh, she had uh, been asking about the recent uptick in, uh, uh, or the perceived uptick in juvenile justice cases. Uh, and I know that in your response to her, you mentioned uh, some of the issues regarding uh, closure of schools uh, uh, and other things that may um, have uh, contributed on, on that end. Uh, to um, you know, providing less structure for uh, for juveniles. I was just wondering if you could point to any specific issues um, on the judicial side, if there are any barriers or, or issues that you've run into during the pandemic uh, in terms of the you know smooth and orderly functioning of the uh, of the of the juvenile side of the uh, judicial branch. Uh, well, from post pandemic. Um, it was a, initially a little bit of a challenge because at least the, the chair that I'm sitting in was not available because this courthouse was closed. Um, so we uh, went to uh, Bridgeport, New Haven. There were basically, initially, there were only two courthouses open. You had Hartford and you had Bridgeport. And our uh, cases from New Haven were being heard there. Although I do have to say that, that um, for all of the most important uh, cases, priority one cases, including the, the uh, juvenile justice, including delinquency cases, um, we were able to uh, operate there in uh, Bridgeport, um, get uh, the most important cases heard. Uh, and um, what, what they did was pretty rapidly before they created this remote platform that we're now all using on Microsoft Teams. Um, for uh, the delinquency cases, we um, had the children, if there were children that were detained, were video cameras, so we were able to get them into court um, that way socially distanced. Um, and then there was a, a computer uh, stationed, it was in the courthouse but not in the courtroom. So we were able to conduct business and, and stay distanced in, in that way. And then there was a, there's a big screen uh, that is in the courtroom um, where uh, that computer would be broadcast from in the, the courthouse um, into, into the courtroom. Uh, and then of course, uh, over the summer, um, our uh, IT people did an amazing job of uh, building up our, our technology and our remote platforms. And uh, once everything started reopening, um, I, I can tell you here in New Haven, uh, we're up running and, and uh, I think whatever um, backlog there was, we've, we've addressed it and, uh, and we're moving forward. Thank you for that answer. And, and through you, Mr. Chairman, just to be clear, so at this point, you wouldn't identify any you know, specific resource constraints or other uh, constraints placed on the judicial branch by, by the pandemic uh, that would limit the, the ability to provide services to juveniles? Um, I don't 
I do not believe so. I think the, 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 some of the challenges, however, and some of the programs and services, I would believe, so instead of being actually present in the home, they're probably telehealth or uh, some remote services. So I think that might continue to be somewhat of a challenge, but in terms of, so that would be on the program and services side, but in terms of judicial operations, I think for the moment we're, we're, uh, we're making do. Great, thank you for that answer. Good to hear and uh, congratulations again on your reunion nomination. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, uh, Representative Howard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you, Your Honor, for being here today. If I could just uh, use a few minutes of your time to help clarify some things for myself and my colleagues. In Connecticut today, if a juvenile is arrested, stopped by a police officer in a stolen car and arrested, there's a limit to how long that police officer can hold that juvenile in custody without an order from you or one of your colleagues. Is that right? Correct. And is that limit six hours, is that correct? That may be correct. And so in order to hold that um, juvenile for excess of that time, if we say it's six hours, and they would need an order from you or one of your colleagues that that juvenile presents a danger to public safety, correct? That's one of the aspects for us to consider. There, there, there are three grounds for an order to detain. That's one of them. So if I were to just offer this to you, um, if, if a juvenile were taken into custody at any time of day, operating a stolen car and assume for the moment they weren't previously adjudicated as delinquent, they have no other charges, um, would you consider that to be something where you would keep that juvenile in custody? Depends on the circumstances. Okay. And if you choose, if you decide that the answer to that question is no, then the police officer then would release that juvenile with a summons to appear before you at some point in the future, correct? Correct. And then you would decide then as, as the presiding judge, what sort of steps would be taken with that particular juvenile in that particular case? Correct, after hearing from all the lawyers and pro juvenile, uh, juvenile probation and everyone else who, who had something to say about that. It, so thank you and for your answer. And what I'm essentially trying to do, Your Honor, is, is clarify for some of my colleagues exactly how the juvenile process works now, because clearly this issue of the stolen cars or juveniles is going to become before this committee in a variety of ways um, in the coming months. So I just wanted to, to clarify for them it, generally how it would happen, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that a police officer would uh, take that person into custody if they were able to stop them. And unless the, the, the judge orders that that juvenile detained within six hours, they'd be released generally to a parent for a court date sometime in the future. Is that about right? That's about right, yes. All right, and I thank you. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the time. And thank you, Judge Marcus, and congratulations on the nomination. You're welcome. Thanks, Representative Howard. Thank you. And I don't see any others. If there are others, you should raise your hand now. And if not, Thank you, Judge Marcus, for your time this morning. Uh, we will now Thank return. You. <laughs> Thank you. We will now return to Roman numeral number one, which was um, for Justice of the Supreme Court, Andrew McDonald, of the Honorable Andrew McDonald of Hartford. Uh, I believe he is in the room with us now. Uh, are you here? I see you. Yes. I uh, have. If, if you would raise your right hand. Uh, for me. Do you swear or affirm, as the case may be, that the information you provide to this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you guide or under penalty of perjury? I do. You may make your opening statement. Thank you, and I apologize to the committee for the technolo technology problem we had, uh, but good morning, Senator Winfield, Representative Staffstrom, Senator Kissel, and Representative Fishbein, and members of the Judiciary Committee. I wanna first thank you for the opportunity to appear virtually before you today. I also wanna thank Governor Lamont for renominating me as an Associate Justice of the Connecticut Supreme Court. And I appreciate his competence and my ability to perform this role. Briefly, by way of background for members of the committee that I do not know, 
I have lived in Connecticut all of my life. I attended Stanford Public Schools before entering college at Cornell University, from which I graduated with a Bachelor of Arts degree. I then earned my Juris Doctor degree with honors from UConn Law School, where I also served as the managing editor of the Connecticut Journal of International Law. Following graduation, I was engaged in the private practice of law for almost 20 years at the law firm of Pullman and Comley, where I was a commercial litigator and chairman of the appellate practice group. While I was in private practice, I also served for more than three years as the director of legal affairs and corporation counsel for the city of Stanford, where I managed the law department, the human resources department, and the benefits department of the city. Thereafter, I served as the state senator from the 27th district for Stanford and Darien from 2003 to 2011. And I was honored to be the Senate chairman of this committee for all eight years I was in the General Assembly. In 2011, I became general counsel to the office of the governor, where I remained until my appointment to the Supreme Court in January of 2013. As I finished my first term on the court, I now am the senior associate justice of the court as the result of the retirements of several of my colleagues. I also serve as the chairman of the Criminal Justice Commission and the chairman of the Rules Committee of the Superior Court. Since I've been on the Supreme Court, I have authored approximately 140 opinions, including 105 majority opinions, 15 concurrences, and 17 dissents. I've enjoyed working with my colleagues on the Supreme Court, all of whom are scholarly, collegial, and committed fully to the rule of law. I am proud to serve with each one of them. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to answer any questions from members of the committee as best I can. Thank you, Justice McDonald. Are there questions from members of the committee? Uh, Senator uh, Kissel. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Justice McDonald, I just wanna say congratulations. That was a fast eight years. Uh, my son just went off to work this morning up in Northampton and he wanted to say he still respects and admires you. Not that he would never have any reason to change that, uh, but we were tremendously honored to see you both, to, to both of us see you sworn in on that first day. I know it must have been hard not to be appointed Chief Justice. That was a tumultuous time. Uh, I really don't have a huge amount of questions. My only question is, you were sort of plunked into the Supreme Court without having any background experience in the Superior Court or Appellate Court. Have you found that to be any kind of hindrance or not a problem whatsoever? Um, not a problem whatsoever. Uh, I, uh, I Obviously, I was a trial attorney for 20 years. I was pretty versed on at least one side of the, the bench about how court operations works. Um, the process of, of judging is very different at, at the superior court level as opposed to an appellate court level. Um, you know, we have the time to research and, uh, and look into things in much more detail than trial court judges have to. Uh, they have to call balls and strikes um, you know, dozens of times a day. Uh, and we have the opportunity to uh, review the law in much greater detail than they do as we do our job. Well, I'm gonna take this opportunity, even though you're justice of the Supreme Court, to call you Andrew. And our family loves you has the most respect for you. And I just can't be happier that you're getting nominated for another term. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, uh, Representative Fishbein. Thank you. Good morning, Justice McDonald. Um, it's nice to see you here today. Congratulations, Congratulations on your uh, reappointment. The, um, there's a few things I wanted to ask you about in reviewing your backup and, you know, recognizing as you just spoke about that you didn't serve in the Superior Court, you know, your role on the Supreme Court is more constitutional um, many times. And in your 
back up, you recognize the federal constitution guarantees minimum standards and, and protections. And I just wanted to, what's your perspective on the supremacy clause? Um, you know, article, um, article six of the federal constitution in conjunction with your role on the Supreme Court. If I understand the question correctly, obviously the supremacy clause um, controls uh, what we do at a state level when, whenever we are uh, adjudicating a federal uh, question. Um, we have a state constitution, obviously, uh, and the Connecticut Supreme Court is supreme in terms of interpreting and applying our own constitution. But when federal constitutional principles are uh, are involved. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court um, rulings are controlling on our court. And what is your position with regard to federal statute? Um, also supreme under the Constitution. If it if it has been inter to for members of the committee who don't. Uh, no, we are authorized to interpret and apply uh, federal statutes if it's within the jurisdiction of a case before our courts. Um, but in interpreting and in applying it, uh, we are guided by uh, the federal interpretations, typically of circuit courts of appeal, though they are not controlling on us. Uh, but if the Supreme Court has interpreted a federal statute, in a particular way that is controlling on our court. And certainly how would that relate to the debate across the country and soon to Connecticut about the legalization of recreational marijuana, considering that it's illegal under federal law? I haven't given that. I mean, that's a very complicated area of the law. Um, and I would imagine uh, that that is being litigated around the country um, as we speak, but I have not studied it in any detail. Well, I'm just trying to test your, your belief, your understanding of the supremacy clause in conjunction with federal law. You know, can a state invalidate a federal law at its whim? when the supremacy clause still exists? No, a, a, a state can't invalidate a federal statute. So if marijuana is illegal, essentially, for recreational use federally, how can a state such as Connecticut even contemplate recreational marijuana legalization? Uh, Representative, that's a uh, that's a um, subject that obviously is going to likely be debated um, in the legislature this year. That's a policy decision uh, for the legislature whether they uh, want to uh, entertain that question, and if so, whether to pass legislation related to that. Well, certainly the legislature has contemplated this committee contemplated it a couple of years ago, and I took the position that. Under the Supremacy Clause, it would be a violation of our oath of office to uphold the federal and the state constitution. So I'm just trying to, you know, based upon your backup, my takeaway would be that your understanding of the Supremacy Clause would be that the state can't legalize recreational marijuana. And I'm just trying to figure out where you are on this issue legally? Well, I'm I'm nowhere on it. It would uh, it would be uh, something that would be litigated, and if it ever got to our court, then uh, then I would focus on uh, the merits of the arguments. I'm not suggesting that I have uh, studied this in any detail or formed any opinion uh, about whether uh, such legislation would um, pass uh, statutory or constitutional muster. So when you say in your backup that there's a guarantee, the federal constitution guarantees minimum standards and protections, you're saying that a state can invalidate a federal law, that that's not so a if, 
protection. Representative, Representative Fishman, not to cut you off, but um, I, will, I would suggest to you that if the question has been answered, even if not to your satisfaction, and you know this, we, we tend not to continue to go back and forth. Yeah, understood. understood. I just, I don't know that I actually got an answer, but I'm going to move on. Um, sir, as the chair of the um, the rules committee, I believe that's one of the roles that you, you fill. Correct. Um, you're aware of the um, discussions by the legislature with regard to 38-8, the 10% uh, cash bail, correct? Yes. And what is your knowledge? I haven't followed it in, in detail. At the, I haven't followed it in detail in the legislature, um, but I am aware of generally that there has been discussion. Okay. And you're aware that in, I think it was 2017, um, this committee considered making the 10% cash bail automatic and not discretionary. I'm not aware. I, I, I don't recall what the legislature did in 2017. I, I'm sure it's fresh in your mind. It's not fresh in mine. Okay. Well, in April of 2019, the rules committee took up that issue do you remember that yes and why did the rules committee take up an issue that um the statute says is discretionary and the rules committee um well what is your understanding as to what the rules committee was going to do with that so we have existing, I don't have it in front of me, but we have existing uh, practice book rules uh, relating to uh, bail. And, uh, and this was a, this is separate and apart, obviously, from any statutes um, that's within the purview of uh, the judicial branch to have practice book rules of, about that type of thing. Um, and the sentencing commission, um, the Connecticut Sentencing Commission uh, unanimously um, proposed to the Rules Committee and therefore to the judges of the Superior Court a modification of an existing practice practice book rule related to bail. Uh, and based on that um, uh, unanimous recommendation, the Rules Committee uh, took up the banner and ultimately uh, uh, passed the rule. Uh, it was then um, transmitted to uh, the leadership of the Judiciary Committee um, for any comments um, and ultimately was the subject of a public hearing uh, and then ultimately uh, subject to a review uh, by all of the judges of the Superior Court. Uh, and then all of the judges of the Superior Court unanimously ad adopted the modification. And you're, you're, you were not aware that in 2017 the legislature took up that very issue and rejected it? I don't believe they rejected it, Representative. My my, it, it, I could be wrong, but my recollection is that there was never any vote on anything um, by the House or the Senate on that subject. Well, because it never made it out of committee. It was proposed in the Judiciary Committee, and then the JFS language. It was voted down. It was the JFS language that was released out of committee in 2017 did not include that. And two years later, the rules committee took it up. You never inquired as to why the legislature wasn't making this change? I, so because language didn't get included in a substitute bill is not an affirmative act by the legislature uh, to disapprove of something. It was never voted on, to my knowledge. It was never debated uh, and never voted on, to my knowledge. So what is the role of the Rules Committee with regard to policy? If the statute says, if the rule says discretion, then that was 
determined by the legislature to be appropriate. At what point is the rules committee empowered to change that discretion and to take that away? The, the balance of this, this is an interesting issue that I used to deal with when I was in the legislature. Uh, the, there, we obviously are co-equal branches of government uh, and uh, we have authority over our internal operations just as the legislature does with adopting rules for the House or rules for the Senate. Um, so we have co-equal co um, uh, authority. Uh, we have tried, as far as I can remember in history and probably for a uh, hundred years beyond that, to respect each branch's independent authority to operate within its purview. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, you did mention that you had authored um, quite a few decisions and I was looking at your backup on page five, question 2025. It says, since your last appointment, please list five citations of decisions you have written. And I saw that that was blank. Um, am I to understand that there should have been something in there? Or is there a different meaning to that? Um, I'm sorry, Representative, I'm trying to pull it up. I don't have it in front of me. I thought I provided, you see I, I, I don't, I can't, um, it's on the page with your signature, sir. No, I don't, I don't have the problem. If you, if you would pause one second, let me get my file. Sure, absolutely. talking about the reappointment form or the appellate and Supreme Court nomination form? I'm looking at, it's titled reappointment nomination. Oh, okay. It was, yeah, reappointment nomination for Superior Court questionnaire. It's the last page signed November 30th, 2020 in question 25 at the top of that page. I did not fill that out, and I apologize for that. Okay. Um, I, I thank you, and um, I, I don't know how we handle that. Whether you sorry, know. Sorry. I, I will be happy to get uh, five citations to the committee um, later today. I apologize for that, Representative. That'd be, that'd be great. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Fishbein. I see uh, Senator Bradley. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I uh, just quickly, I, I, I've never had the, the pleasure of meeting you, Justice, but uh, your reputation precedes you. And, um, and, it, and it's one of excellence as other members have already made comments of. Uh, I wanted to commend you on the uh, rule change that you've made dealing specifically with the issue that Representative Fishbein was discussing on, on bail. It's something which I hope as, as we take up this legislative cycle to make uh, amendments on our end as a practicing attorney who does a lot in criminal um, criminal courts. Uh, I see that there's a lot of abuses when it comes to that. And I think that those those rule modification to uh, 
I won't say limit someone's disc- a judge's discretion, but I say to kind of focus it and, and make it a little bit more equitable uh, were appropriate from what I've seen uh, with our, the system here in, in Connecticut. Um, so I commend you for um, leading the charge in that. What I understand was your your lead in, in, in having those rules uh, be changed and modified. So I commend you for that. And, and I think that you, you uh, in that discussion with Representative Fishbein, illuminating at least myself in terms of how to shepherdize something like that and, and shows the, the pedigree that you have and in, in the, in the great uh, job we did in selecting you up to the Supreme Court. Kudos. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Sorry. You can respond if you want. No, I'm, I'm done. No, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, I see Representative Blumenthal. Hi, Mr. Justice. Hi. Oh. Hi, Mr. Justice. Nice to see you. Um, thanks for being with us today. And uh, I just want to say uh, we're very proud to have you here as a son of Stanford. And sorry to have lost you as a Stanford resident and constituent recently. But um, and I won't say where you've gone for your privacy. But uh, thank you for all your service at various levels to our legal profession and in uh, to the judiciary. I just had one question. Uh, I love your perspective on Connecticut has kind of a middle road approach when it comes to uh, insulating judges from the political process uh, compared to the federal process, which guarantees life tenure during good behavior. It's a little less insulated to the, to the political process compared to other states where many of judges are directly elected. It's more insulated. Um, I was wondering, based on your experience uh, as justice so far, if you could uh, give us a bit of perspective on what you think of Connecticut system uh, with its eight year term subject to reappointment. You know, thank you for the question. Um, it's one of those issues that uh, maybe I think it's the best because it's ours. Um, but I, I do think Connecticut has a very, uh, very um, positive um, framework for trying to keep judges um, accountable to the elected branches of government without directly uh, having them elected um, by the people of the state. Uh, in, in fact, um, my court is one of uh, 12 uh, courts in the country that have some version of appointed um, appointments to the bench by uh, a governor and the legislature. Um, 38 states elect their court of last resort. Uh, and uh, for the life of me, uh, I don't see how that is a good, uh, a good idea. Um, because it, it, whether you can, you can try as best you might, but uh, you invariably create a political environment in which um, uh, judges have to operate and, uh, and I don't think they should operate in that sphere at all. Thank you, Justice McDonald. I uh, appreciate your perspective on that and all the answers you've given to the committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Blumenthal. And I saw when you began that reporter was trying to say something, although I don't see a hand. I just want to make sure she doesn't have a comment or question. I'm all set, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay. okay. Are there? I don't see anyone else. Are there any others? Um, if not, let me ask you just briefly, and I don't want to get too far outside of your role as a justice, but you, you have a maybe unique experience having been a trial attorney and legislator who chaired this committee, the justice and the chair of the, the Criminal Justice Commission. And I think you know that um, there are plenty of proposals coming to us, and we were just talking about um, some accountability. So I, I wonder if in your role as a justice, given that all of these things are going to mesh together, um, do, do you think uh, there are things that we should be thinking about, and this relates to your role as chair of the CJ, uh, CJC, uh, in terms of accountability of, of prosecutors? And I don't want you to go too far out on a limb because we're trying to stick to what you do. But if you had a comment or two that might be useful to this committee as we Consider that in the session. I would like to hear it. Uh, well, thank you, Senator. Um, 
I, I would, I don't have a comment in the sense that uh, I would never advance uh, a policy uh, proposal um, for you to consider. Um, having said that, uh, it, it would be within my uh, role as chairman of the Criminal Justice Commission uh, to uh, testify before your committee if the legislature has proposed something and, and seeks my, uh, my comments um uh, uh on that legislation i i think that would be an, an appropriate place for me to offer a view on something that you folks are proposing thank you and, that, and that's useful and just so i'm clear so if something is before us you would be willing to testify to the the policy proposal and with your expertise it, it, yeah we, we hear uh judges are limited we, we can't volunteer to do it but if we are uh if we are asked to testify uh by the committee we can thank you and i think given that you have a the role that you have uh you may be asked uh thank you very much are there comments or questions from others if not thank you very much for joining us this morning uh justice mcdonald uh thank next, you thank you next we will hear from uh candidates to be uh up for nomination for senior judge, uh, beginning with the Honorable Frank uh, Diadabo of Cromwell. Um, are you, I think I saw it. I'm here. Oh, great. Would you raise your right hand? Okay. Do you swear or affirm, as the case may be, that the information you provide to this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God, or under penalty of perjury? I do. Okay, great. Thank you. You may make your first statement, your opening statement. Thank you. Good morning, Senator Winfield and Representative Sandstrom, Vice Chair Senator Kasser, Representative Blumenthal, Senator Kissel, and Representative Fishbein. First, I would like to thank you and the members of the Judiciary Committee for giving me the opportunity to appear before you today and have the consider committee consider my nomination. I would also like to thank Governor Ned Lamont for having the confidence in my judicial abilities to nominate me for my fourth eight year term as a judge, now senior judge of the Superior Court. Uh, it has been an honor and a privilege to serve the citizens of Connecticut in my capacity as a judge for these years. I remember this honor and privilege every time I enter the courtroom. I was originally appointed to the bench in 1996 and have had the good fortune of being assigned to judicial districts staffed with dedicated people and serving with talented and dedicated colleagues. During my most recent judicial term, I have been assigned to the New Britain Judicial District, the Criminal Division of the Harford Judicial District, and I am presently assigned to the New Britain Judicial District. My primary responsibilities in these judicial districts has been as a criminal trial judge for both Part A and Part B cases. During this past term outside the courtroom, I have continued to be a member of the Criminal Jury Instruction Committee. I have sat by designation on the appellate court. I have been a mentor for newly appointed judges, and I also teach a class with Justice Maria Khan at UConn School of Law. I can honestly state that there has been, not been a day that I have not looked forward to the challenges and responsibilities taking the bench. I would be most grateful for this committee and to the General Assembly for approving my nomination and I will be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Uh, are there questions, comments from members of the committee? I don't, oh, Representative Fishbein. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Thank you. Thank you for coming before the committee today. Um, you know, criminal law being a very interesting constitutional area of law, I just wanted to ask um, what you found to be the most difficult aspect of establishing fairness during the COVID in the criminal law or, or criminal courts? Uh, that's a question that I'll have to answer in two ways. Um, sir. First is that uh, 
I am aware of uh, the steps that have been taken by the judicial branch to do their best to ensuring the safety as well as the processing of, uh, of stakeholders through the courts. Um, unfortunately, because of the budgetary reasons, I as a trial judge, uh, first as a senior judge, Judge Carroll has made a budgetary decision not to have uh, senior judges work. And secondly, obviously because of the lack of juries, I haven't been in. So I haven't been uh, directly affected by the, the COVID because we have not been uh, working. However, I am aware because, as you indicated, my interest in involvement in criminal law to feel that one of the major challenges of COVID and slash the criminal law is going to be to handle the uh, speedy trial rights, the rights of defendants that have been uh, kind of postponed for a period of time to get them back into the court system, to get them in front of juries so they can litigate their cases. Well, thank you. I thank you for that answer. That's all I had. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Representative Stashton. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Judge. Congratulations on your renomination. Um, you know, I thought maybe just briefly, because we have a couple new members of the committee, uh, give you a better job than I can of explaining what the difference in our system is between uh, Superior Court judge, senior judge, and judge. Okay. I think I heard your question. It was broken up a little bit, Representative Sampson, but I think you were trying, uh, you were asking me what's the difference between a senior judge on the Superior Court and a uh, Superior Court judge? And the JTR. In the JTR. Well, the easy one is the JTR. That's when you reach the age of 70. Uh, you uh, are no longer a senior judge or a, um, or a uh, Superior Court judge, but obviously, as there are many in our on our system, very talented individuals uh, that are continue to be utilized and very helpful. Their jurisdiction is uh, limited. Uh, I know spe specifically concerning the criminal justice process, uh, they can't do jury trials and things of that sort, only by agreement. Uh, a senior judge has the full powers of a sitting judge. Uh, the only difference is that he's quote unquote, or she is retired uh, and is allowed to work as a uh, trial judge or a, a superior court judge for a period of time, but it's limited as to how much time you can, uh, can work. Uh, I, for example, uh, sit as a trial judge. So I work five days a week on trial, doing trial one after another. And then when my time allotment uh, ends, I stop and then start again um, after that. Superior Court judge has all uh, the powers. Senior judge has all the powers, just limited time. And the JTRs is an age issue um, uh, and had, has less powers as the senior or the Superior Court judge. Thank you, Judge. Appreciate you uh, explaining that. The um, Representative O'Day. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, Your Honor. Hi. Um, just real quick, uh, I just want to thank you for your service. I don't do any criminal work, never have. Um, but uh, we have a mutual friend and Judge uh, Kevin Doyle and a fellow friar. And I just wanted to tell you that you are uh, obviously have a fan uh, with Judge Doyle. And I want to thank you for your service and uh, go friars. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Representative. Any, any further questions or comments? Being none, Judge, thank you for uh, being with us. Thank you. Um, next up, we will hear from Honorable Maria A. Cooper of Avon, the senior judge. Judge Gleason, if you might raise your right hand for me. Do you swear or affirm, as the case may be, that the information you'll provide to this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God or under penalty of perjury? I do. Great. Thank you. Um, if you have an opening statement, you can feel free to make it. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Senator Winfield, Representative Staffstrom, 
Senator Kissel, Representative Fishbein, and members of the Judiciary Committee. I'm honored to appear before you today. I first want to thank Governor Lamont for nominating me for reappointment for a third term as a judge of the Superior Court, now as a senior judge. At the time of my last reappointment in 2013, I was serving as a civil judge in the Judicial District of New Britain. In March of that year, I was reassigned to the child protection session at Middlesex to replace an esteemed colleague who had been elevated to the appellate court. My next assignment returned me to New Britain where I served in the civil division for two years. In 2015, I was again assigned to the child protection session at Middlesex where I also handled delinquency and child protection matters. My next assignment returned me to New Britain in 2016 where I served in the GA. After I elected to take senior status at the end of December of 2016, I continued to handle the GA docket four days per week until the end of June of that year. After that, I handled a variety of civil matters, administrative appeals, and some juvenile matters. I should also mention that for about two years, I handled the GA docket in Bristol every Tuesday until the closure of the Bristol Courthouse in the, uh, at the end of the summer of 19, uh, 2019. Since electing senior status, I have also regularly conducted pre-argument conferences for the Connecticut Supreme and Appellate Courts. It has truly been an honor to serve as a Superior Court judge these past 16 years. I now seek and would be most grateful for your support and approval for a third term, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Judge. Uh, are there questions from the committee for Judge Gleason? Questions for Judge Gleason? Seeing none, uh, I thank you for being with us today, Judge. Thank you. Uh, we will now turn to um, nominations for reappointment as uh, state referees. Uh, first up will be the Honorable Marshall K. Berger, Jr. of Canton. Judge Berger, are you with us? Good morning. Good morning, Judge. Uh, if you might raise your right hand for me, please. If you swear or affirm as the case that the information you provide to this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, the help of God or under I do. Thank you, Judge. Go ahead. Make it. We do have a little technical uh, voice issue here, so a lot of that was garbled. But Chairman uh, Winfield, Chairman, Chairman Staffstrom, Senator Kissel, Representative Fishbane, members of the committee, good morning. It's an honor to appear before you today for consideration of this my fifth term. It has been a great privilege to serve the citizens of the state of Connecticut for the past 32 years as a Superior Court judge, as a senior judge, and now as a judge trial referee. I want to thank Governor Lamont for this nomination. Over the past eight years, at least up until the COVID epidemic started, I have presided over the land use court in Hartford, hearing a variety of matters this specialized court is one of just a few in the country dedicated to complex land use cases. I would hope to have the honor of continuing my service to the people of Connecticut. I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Judge. Um, I switched computers. I don't know if you can hear me better. I can. Thank All you. Right, great. great. Sorry about that. Uh, Senator Kissel. There we go. Uh, Judge Berger, you were like one of my first judges when I started practice. I just want everyone on this committee to know how wonderful you were, how understanding you were, how empathetic you were, and how dedicated you are. Uh, you were asked to attend certain events and you said you had to go do things with your children. That was the right decision as time marches on, folks need to understand that family comes first. And I just, I just wanna sing your praises and tell you that I hugely admire you and 
congratulate you and wish you the very best, best going forward. Thank you, Senator Kissel. Thank you. Um, are there other questions uh, from the committee? Um, I see Representative Fishbein. There we go. Uh, good morning, Judge Berger. How are you? Good morning. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, send condolence. Uh, well, good wishes from Representative Carpino, who represents that she at one point um, clerked for you, I believe. Um, she wanted to say hi. The um, Yes, she did. Please say hello to her. I shall. And I don't know if you remember, but back in uh, 97 through 99, when you were at uh, the New Britain Superior Court, I was a clerk there and from time to time would, would clerk for you uh, every once in a while. Um, I, I remember that. <laughs> since that time, I've been before you a few times. And in fact, you even uh, were very gracious to take a case for mediation, a very complex case that I had with uh, one plaintiff and about 20 defendants involving a land use dispute. And I really appreciate all the work that you did on that case. You know, I have no questions. I just know that every time that um, either I came to you with a question while I was a clerk, and I know other judges came to you for questions, you were always deliberative and respectful. And um, I appreciate that. And I'm sure everybody else does as well. So I, w I congratulate you on your uh, reappointment and um, look forward to uh, future great, great things. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Representative Dubitsky. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Judge, for coming in. Uh, I, I'd uh, been in front of Judge Berger a number of times, and uh, some of the decisions he's issued I vigorously disagreed with. Um, some <laughs> of them I agreed with. Uh, but that's sort of how it works in the judicial system. But I did want to relate uh, one incident where um, I was actually doing a, a bench trial uh, before Judge Berger, and um, we were a good way into the trial when uh, the judge realized that the damages that the plaintiffs were essentially looking for were primarily attorney's fees. And um, I was very impressed that Judge Berger essentially shut the whole trial down and brought everybody into the um, into chambers and essentially screamed at everybody and said, we're not trying a case about attorney's fees here. This is supposed to be a land use issue and uh, sort of forced the, um, the litigants to start talking about a settlement, which the case actually did settle. And uh, frankly, I, I would, um, I, I very much appreciated that. And I, I would hope that more judges actually look at what's truly before them as opposed to um, you know what 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 is on the surface and really look look beyond the the pleadings and the arguments and the testimony and really see what's going on there and and I, I appreciated that and I will remember that um, and I, I considered that a very uh, a very good piece of judging in, in my view. So I just wanted to uh, relay that story to everybody and, um, and I appreciate it. And I thank you judge for uh, what you do and, uh, and congratulations on your renomination. Thank you, sir. Thank you, representative. Further questions from the committee? Further questions from Kenny? If not, uh, Judge Berger, appreciate you being with us today and, and your um, long and distinguished service to uh, our state's judiciary. Thank you. Um, next up will be um, the Honorable John F. Cronin of Branford to be a state referee. Judge Cronin.
Judge Cronin. Good morning. Good morning, Judge. Can you turn your camera on? There we go. Can you um, pull the camera down a little bit just so we can see your face and I can give you the oath here? There we are. All right, Judge, if you uh, might raise your right hand for me. Uh, do you swear or affirm as the case may be that the information you provide to this committee will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help you God or under penalty of perjury. I do. Great. Uh, Judge, if you have an opening statement, uh, you can please make it. Senator Winfield, <clears throat> Representative Staffstrom, Senator Kissel, Representative Fishbein, members of the committee, I thank you for having me here today. I'd first like to thank Governor Lamont for the recommendation for a new term. Since my last appointment, I have been assigned as the presiding judge in the New Haven Judicial Court. I have set for civil matters in the Meriden Court. I've been the presiding judge in GA 17 in Bristol. And until Friday, the 13th of March, 2020, I was working four days a week in the arraignment court at GA 23 in New Haven. Since that time, I have made myself available to review warrants for various New Haven area police departments, uh, particularly Brantford and North Brantford has taken me up on this. And I am a member of what is called the taxi squad in the New Haven judges uh, circle, which is made up of uh, trial referees who are available to fill in when coverage is needed on a volunteer basis. I consider the last 16 years to have been a very, very rewarding experience in my legal career. I would welcome the opportunity to continue my service during when things return to normal, as I hope they will very soon. And I'd be willing to answer any questions of the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Um, are there any questions for uh, Judge Cronin? Questions for Judge Cronin? Uh, seeing none, Judge, I uh, appreciate you being with us and appreciate your, uh, your long service to the judicial branch in the state of Connecticut. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up will be um, the Honorable um, Constance Honorable L. Epstein of Glastonbury. Judge Epstein, are you with us? I, I hope I am. Okay. You know, Judge, we've got a little bit of feedback um, when you're on mute. Do you have another, do you have one device on or two? Um, is it better if I sit back like this? Oh, well, let's give it a shot. Go ahead and make your opening statement. Oh, well, actually, I got to administer. Could you, could, you, could, you, could you raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm as the case may be that the information you provide to this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God or under penalty of perjury? I do. Great. Uh, now you can make your opening statement, please. Thank you. Good morning to the chairpersons, the ranking members, and indeed all of the members of this committee. I thank the governor for his confidence in nominating me to serve another term as a judge trial referee. And I thank this committee for the opportunity to be, appear before it. I started practicing law in 1979. At first work, working for the office, legislative research assigned to this very Judiciary Committee. In 1981, I went into private practice with a law firm in Hartford, eventually becoming, I might say proudly, the first woman partner in that year's more than 200-year history. After I was appointed to the bench in 2004, with the exception of part a criminal and habeas corpus dockets, I have been assigned to almost every other discipline and have considered matters in the GA court, family, juvenile, child protection, and housing. And I have served in Rockville, Hartford, 
Waterbury in Middletown. In 2013, as a JTR, I was assigned to the civil docket, returning there from my practice, and I have served there since. I cannot think of a more rewarding occupation than in one, the one in which I have been privileged to work. I considered it a privilege to continue, and I hope to continue to have the opportunity to do that. I would be more than happy to answer any questions that anyone might have. Thank you. Questions from the committee? Seeing none, uh, Judge, and for your um, long time service to the state. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> next week. Next, we will hear from the Honorable William uh, Maralis of Stanford. Uh, are you here? I see you in the list of people. Are you? You, you have to unmute. Judge, my, you're on, you're on mute. Um, um, oh, there you are. Can, can you hear me? I, I don't have any sound. All right, we are going to uh, move on and allow you to work on your technical difficulties. Uh, next, we'll hear from the Honorable Barbara M. Quinn of Chester. Good morning. Good morning. Would you um, raise your right hand? Okay, uh, do you swear or affirm, as the case may be, that the information you uh, provide to this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God or under penalty of perjury? I do. Uh, uh, you Senator may, may, Win Yeah, Sorry, go ahead. You, go ahead. <laughs> Jump the gun. <laughs> At any rate, Senator Winfield, Representative Sandstrom, Senator Kissel and Representative Fishbein and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. I would also like to thank Governor Lamont for nominating me for an additional term as a state referee. I was first appointed in 1996 and uh, have had the honor and privilege to serve uh, it as a judge since that time. I much like that picture of your children, I must say. <laughs> Um, at any rate, the, the last time I appeared, there you are. How are you today? <laughs> Good, I see you. <laughs> the last time I appeared before you, I was the chief court administrator and in my last year in that position, and I stepped down at the end of that year when I became a judge trial referee. Since that time, I've returned to my resident courthouse in Middlesex County, and I have heard juvenile, civil, and family matters here, both on the regular docket and on the two specialty dockets, statewide dockets that are located here, the regional family trial docket and the child protection session of the ju juvenile court, where uh, we hear uh, termination of parental rights trials. I also handle civil matters and um, was reminded, as we heard from Judge Berger, that I also receive referrals from his land use docket and also affordable housing appeals from time to time. I have conducted many pretrials in all those areas as well as mediations. And uh, during this pandemic, I have learned the new procedures for remote hearings, conducted a few, and pretrials and mediations continue. Um, I also was able to participate in the pre-argument appellate conferences 
for the appellate court until those were suspended at the onset of the pandemic. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have of me. Thank you, Judge. Are there questions for uh, for Judge Quinn? Uh, Senator Kissel. Yeah, hi. Uh, I just want to say great to see you, Judge Quinn. You were a great chief court administrator. And uh, I'm really happy that you're renominated and you're still active. Well, thank you for your comments. I'm grateful I'm not the chief court administrator now. <laughs> you would still love it. <laughs> thank you, Senator Kissel. Are there other comments? Uh, Representative Paul. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, Judge. It's great to see a fellow Chesterian um, before us today. Uh, I noticed um, in your questionnaire that you said you enjoy the pretrial mediation aspect of the work. I, and I was wondering specifically if you had, if you could comment on the issue of um, parental alienation that comes up sometimes in cases of suspect, suspected domestic violence where there is a custody battle in which um, the person being accused of the domestic violence can sometimes claim alienation as a way of taking the children away from the suspected victim. Is that something you've dealt with? And do you have any um, ideas on how the court can protection for domestic violence? Thank you. Uh, I have had cases where the issue has been raised and they are often very difficult cases to untangle. Uh, you know, each parent obviously has a desire to see their children um, and to have access and how that access should be handled um, it is often a question. Obviously, there are custodial issues depending on what actually has gone on. Um, so I would say those are the among the most difficult of family cases to deal with. Um, there are certainly aspects of that that also sometimes appear in the juvenile court and in the last um, eight years much of my work has been on the termination of parental rights cases but the cases in particular from the regional family trial docket here in middletown often raise the problems that you mentioned uh, what what are some of the factors that you take into consideration when you're trying to decide um, the authenticity of a, of a claim of current alienation on the part of the suspected abuser? Uh, there are all the factors that are uh, listed in our statute uh, concerning uh, custodial determinations. Uh, we don't really recognize that syndrome in the label that's been placed on it, although people come and testify um about it so we think about what are, what has been the connection of the children to the parent in question what has been the conduct of the parent um, what do individuals who appear before us perhaps a guardian ad litem or an attorney for the minor child have to say um, in closing arguments or perhaps in testimony depending on who they call the testimony Testify. So it's really a very multifactorial determination and how strong each of those pieces of evidence might be. It's hard to say generally. I think particularly in the family arena, the specific facts um, weigh a great deal. Thank you, Judge Quinn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Rep. Thank you, Representative Palm. Are there questions from other members of the committee? I do not, do not see any. Um, thank you very much for joining us, Judge. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Let's try to see if we can get Judge uh, Matalisa back in. Judge, can you unmute yourself now? Um, that is looking like it may be a no. Yes. Yep. Oh, wait. Okay, nope. Unmuted. There. Yep. I can hear you now. Hey, there we go. Are you there? Uh, we hear you. 
Yeah. Uh, Judge, can you raise your right hand for me? All right, I'll, I'll give you a second to get your earpiece in. Can you can you raise your right hand for me, Judge? Judge Modelis, can you raise your right hand for me? Can you hear me? Judge Modelis, yes. Yes, can, yes. Can you raise your I right can hand? hear you. Can you hear me? We hear you. Yes. yes. Uh, do you swear or affirm, as the case may be, that the information you provide to this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you guide or under penalty of perjury? I do. Okay, you may make your opening statement. Not only did he raise his right Thank hand, you. he stood up. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only way I know how to do it. <laughs> Good morning, chairpersons of the Judiciary Committee. Good morning, chairpersons of the Judiciary Committee and distinguished members of that committee. Today, I am privileged to appear before you for the fifth time in my 32-year career as a judge and judge trial referee of the Connecticut Superior Court. I wish to express my gratitude to Governor Lamont for seeing fit to nominate me for another term on the bench. And I also express my appreciation to this committee for inviting me to appear before it today. Finally, I thank the people of the state of Connecticut for whom I have had the privilege to serve these past 32 years. Here is a brief rundown of my judicial service during that time. My judicial career has been as varied as it has been fulfilling. It began in September of 1988 with an interim appointment with an assignment to GA2, where I broke in as an arraignment and criminal court judge. After more than a year, I was transferred to the Danbury JD GA, where I spent 18 wonderful months. In the latter part of 1991, I was sent to my home district of Stanford, Norwalk, where I served as a trial judge and later as the presiding judge for civil matters. Thereafter, I spent three and one half years as the juvenile judge for Stanford, Norwalk. At that point, I was sent back to Bridgeport to become the presiding judge for civil matters and thereafter a civil trial judge. In 2002, the need arose for a juvenile judge in Bridgeport, where I served for another year. From 2003 until 2010, I served as the juvenile judge for Norwalk and Stanford. And from that time until the present, I have been assigned to Stanford, first doing juvenile and later serving as a trial judge for civil matters, which I have continued to do until the shutdown. In addition, I uh, conducted uh, pretrials for both delinquency and child protection matters in the Juvenile Matters Court. In addition to my regular duties, I have had the following responsibilities. In 1991 to 1995, I was served as a member of the Criminal Justice Commission. And from 1996 through 1997, I was a member of the Rules Committee of the Superior Court. From 1998, 1993 to date, one, I was one of the, or I am, one of the few judges assigned to do affordable housing land use appeals. And with Judge Marshall Berger was the first of two judges in the state to do so. From 19, in 1996 through 1997, I was president of the Connecticut Judges Association and I have been a seven-time member of the faculty of the Connecticut Judges Institute. I humbly ask that you look favorably on my nomination as I look forward to resuming my duties when conditions permit. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judge. I make Are myself there... available to questions. Thank you very much. I didn't mean to cut you off. Are there questions or comments from members of the committee? I do not see any. That being the case, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Uh, next, we thank will you. hear. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll hear from the Honorable Dale W. Radcliffe of Bridgeport. Bridgeport. Good morning. Good morning. Am I, uh, am I muted, Mr. Chairman? 
we, we are we can hear you loud and clear. At least I can. All right. Uh, All right. I, I'd All ask right. that you raise your right hand so I can swear you in. Uh, do you swear? Yeah, I can see you. Do you swear or affirm, as the case may be, that the information you provide to this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you, God, or under penalty of perjury? I do. Okay, you may make your opening statement. Uh, uh, Chairman uh, Winfield, Chairman Sassum, ranking members Fishbein, Kissel, and members of the uh, Judiciary Committee. I want to uh, thank the committee, first of all, for the opportunity to appear before you remotely and to thank Governor Lamont for nominating me to be a judge trial referee. This is the fourth time that I have uh, appeared before the, uh, the committee on this side of the table since being nominated to be a Superior Court judge in 1997. Uh, I was last before the committee in 2013. Since that time, I have served as a civil judge, almost exclusively, although in Bridgeport, but I believe uh, for a short time in, uh, in Derby as, uh, as well. And um, during that period of time, I have heard civil jury cases. Um, I have heard uh, uh, civil court trials uh, with an emphasis on uh, administrative appeals and uh, zoning cases in the uh, Judicial District of Fairfield at uh, Bridgeport. Since uh, September of 2019, when I attained the age of 70, and as Judge Stoddling has often said, became a uh, constitutional idiot, I um, have served as a state trial uh, referee. My duties didn't change between September of 2019 uh, 19 and uh, March of 2020, uh, prior to COVID, I continued to hear um, jury trials when uh, the litigants would agree, continued to hear court trials, and continued to serve uh, primarily on the court side with a responsibility for administrative appeals in the uh, Judicial District of Fairfield the Birch Board, as well as certain uh, arbitration and property tax cases. Uh, since March of 2020, when the courts have shut down, I have continued to serve as uh, a uh, almost in the same capacity. I really haven't missed a beat. I've been uh, doing pretrials three or four days a week, have maintained a full uh, short calendar schedule as I do uh, currently, although as has been said uh, earlier, Judge trial referees are not uh, in the courthouse and are not being uh, compensated at this point for our uh, for our services. Um, since March, I, I have done uh, pretrials, uh, and uh, by way of uh, full disclosure, I did contact the co-chair of this committee at one point and uh, indicated uh, the situation regarding um, uh, judge trial referees. Uh, informing him that it was um, uh, my opportunity, I guess, to, to from this side to actually contact my state representative and uh, discuss a particular problem of public interest. I would be uh, pleased to answer any questions and would hope for the opportunity to continue serving the people in this district and the people of the state of Connecticut as a judge trial referee. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Senator Kissel. Uh -oh. <laughs> Judge Radcliffe, this is like old old home day for me in a lot of ways, having served for so many years with Justice McDonald, uh, first coming before Judge Berger, and I've got a I've got a story I'm going to tell about Judge Berger when we vote on Judge Berger, uh, but. Judge Radcliffe, you and I served on the Judiciary Committee way back when, and I just can't believe how the years have flown by, and I just want to commend you on your service to the people of the state of Connecticut. It's been a long haul, and you've done a great job, and I just wanted to put that on the record. Well, uh, Senator, I want to thank you for your, uh, your kind words. Uh, we both served with someone who recently died and that was uh, Representative Dick Foley. And every time a new member came to the uh, House of Representatives at that time, 
uh, whether that person was in the majority or the minority party, Representative Foley would ask them who was sitting where they were uh, 20 years ago. Most people couldn't answer that question. And uh, he would then say, see, in 20 years from now, who do you think is going to remember you? Now, I, I believe that uh, most of my uh, re recollection, or most of my knowledge of the committee process and the General Assembly has probably been repealed in the uh, 25 years uh, since I uh, last served as the uh, ranking member of, uh, of this committee and last served in the General Assembly. But uh, it is uh, refreshing to know, Senator, that at least one person uh, can remember, and uh, there are exceptions to the Foley rule. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Uh, we will hear from uh, Representative Stasho, followed by Representative O'Day. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, Judge, uh, good to see you outside of the neighborhood. Uh, I, I am that uh, um, full disclosure, uh, Judge Radcliffe, former Representative Radcliffe is a uh, constituent and a neighbor. Um, uh, but Judge, I just want to take take a moment. We could, we could almost conduct this uh, interview over the back fence, Mr. Chairman. I was going to say I'm up in Hartford today, but if I had done it from a back deck, we could have we I could have swore you in in person, I guess. But um, anyway, Judge, I I do want to um, uh, just thank you publicly. We did have an opportunity to talk uh, early on in the pandemic, um, and I do know there is at least a handful, maybe more, of um, uh, JTRs, Judge Trial Referees, who really have gone above and beyond um, during this pandemic, continue to work um, almost a full slate uh, on a pro bono basis, basically, uh, to help move business through the system. And, and I know um, you're one of that one of that handful. Um, and I want to uh, publicly thank you, um, mainly on behalf of, of the Bridgeport Bar, who I know appreciates the fact that uh, you move so much business through the courthouse um, in, in order to keep the wheels of justice uh, churning in our state's largest city. So um, thank you and congratulations on your renomination. Right. Thank you and thank you for your, uh, your kind words, Mr. Chairman. Representative Volga. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Your Honor, I just wanted to uh, echo the comments by Senator Kissel and Representative Stastrom. Thank you for your years of service, both uh, from the bench and uh, as a state representative and uh, the, the residents of the state of Connecticut have been uh, blessed to have you in their service. So thank you, sir, and and uh, good luck. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Senator uh, Bradley. Uh, it's a, an honor to be in front of you, Your Honor, echoing the sentiments of those who come before me. Uh, singing your praises. Uh, you and I share a special history. My first and only loss in a trial was uh, when you presided over that trial. Not to your fault, my fault, obviously, but uh, I learned a lot of lessons on that trial. And um, and, and, and you've always been uh, consciously or subconsciously a mentor of mine and, and, a, and a, a tremendous jurist. So you're much appreciated. And thank you very much for that. And I, and I will never forget that loss. It was the first and only time I ever lost a trial. So I'll, I'll always have you in the back of my mind. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Representative Callahan. Judge Radcliffe, I'm not sure if you remember me, but we uh, we worked together in Danbury Superior Court many years ago. And I'm glad to see you're well, and I hope uh, many, many 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 years ago. I remember you were a uh, probation officer, uh, Mr. Uh, Callahan, back then, I believe. Yes, correct. And we used to talk high school football, and I refereed. So I'm glad to see you're well, and I just want to right. Say you you were you were you were a referee. And your father was still active on the on the bench, and we did talk about uh, high school football. And there was another uh, uh, lawyer there who was also a, a referee, um, who, um, <laughs> who 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 shared a few stories as well. I do remember. I just want to say hello. It's good to see you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Representative. Are there questions or comments from other members of the committee? Mm -hmm. I do not see any more, if that is the case. Thank you very much for joining us this morning, or actually afternoon now, Judge. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, next, it's, we'll hear from you. It is now afternoon. Thank you. Yeah. 
Uh, next, we'll hear from the Honorable Robert T. Resha of uh, Danbury. Uh, are you there? Yes, sir, I am. Okay, Judge, I need you to turn your camera on. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, uh, would you raise your right hand? Uh, do you swear or affirm, as the case may be, that the information you provide to this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God or under penalty of perjury? I do. Uh, you may uh, provide your opening statement. Thank you. Honorable co-chairs and members of the Judiciary Committee, I would like to first thank you for this opportunity to present myself to your committee for reappointment as a judge trial referee for the state of Connecticut. Of course, I would also like to thank Governor Lamont for honoring me with his nomination. First, I would like to point out that in paragraph 18 of your questionnaire, uh, that is to be uh, amended. I did send a message to your committee indicating the change to my answer and the reasons for it. Although I believe my message was self-explanatory, I would, of course, be willing to answer any questions you may have in that regard. Although initially I was assigned to different courts from juvenile to criminal jury trials when I first became a judge, for about 20 of my almost 24 years on the bench, I have been assigned to family matters. In that regard, I was the presiding judge of family matters in both New Britain and Waterbury over the course of seven years have conducted numerous trials and hearings on divorce and custody cases over many years, and have been actively involved in the pretrial and mediation of complex family cases before trial. I have been humbled by the honor of being a judge, and am now respectfully asking to be reappointed for another term as a judge trial referee. I would be glad to uh, answer any questions you might have, and I'd like to thank you once again for your considerations. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Representative Rapimbis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and it's certainly an honor, Judge Risha, to be here, um, obviously witnessing once again your nomination um, to the bench. With that said, I just wanted to let everyone know that I have had the pleasure of appearing before Judge Risha in pretrial, numerous pretrials, as well as mediations, not only in the Waterbury Court, but in the Danbury Court. And I must say that this is an individual not only very well respected by his colleagues, but certainly members of the bar for being very prepared when the attorneys walk in with some of the most uh, contentious, sensitive issues in family court. Um, and I know that based on my experience, a lot of the recommendations were pretty much spot on and has led to many settlements, um, which is certainly appreciated not only by us attorneys, but the clients most importantly. So I just wanted to uh, congratulate you, Your Honor, once again on your nomination and certainly implore this committee to support it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much. Nice to see you. Thank you, Representative. Are there comments or questions from other members of the committee? Uh, Representative Godfrey. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I really appreciate it. Bob, good to see you. I, uh, for, for everybody else, the full disclosure, I knew uh, uh, Judge Risha when he was Corporation Counsel. Well, I was on the City Council in Danbury, and that was a very long time ago. We won't talk about how long, um, okay. but uh, he was uh, uh, fair, a lawyer's lawyer, um, very uh, knowledgeable, um, good at research, good at uh, um, helping us uh, make decisions, and he has certainly done that kind of work uh, for the last uh, umpty ump years uh, mm -hmm. while he's been uh, on the bench. I'm uh, so uh, delighted to see you're, uh, you're, you're not going quietly into a retirement, but you're going to continue uh, working on for the people of the state of Connecticut, uh, and I do commend uh, both you uh, and uh, certainly urge all of my colleagues to, uh, to support your uh, renomination. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. So nice to see you. Thank you. Are there comments or questions? Uh, Representative Fishbaugh. Representative. Good afternoon, Judge Risha. Nice to see you again. Thank you. 
Um, I don't know if you recall, but I was the family clerk when you first became a judge some 20 years ago and, I uh, and passed off. And, and I would um, agree with Representative Rabimbus that even from the beginning, you were always prepared. And I know since that time, I've been before you on a few restraining orders up in Waterbury at one time. And um, I've always thought you to be fair and um, looking at both sides, especially in these family cases that are so different. So uh, I do congratulate you on your renomination and uh, look forward to perhaps working with you in the future. So thank you. Thank Mr. you. Chair. I do appreciate your comments. Thank you, Representative. Are there any other comments or questions from members of the committee? I do not see any. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, sir. Uh, next, we'll hear from the Honorable John Turner of Hamden. Are you on? I see you, yes. Would you raise your hand for me, your right hand? Uh, do you swear or affirm, as a case may be, that the information you provide to this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you guide or under penalty of perjury? I do. Uh, you may help provide your opening statement. Well, good afternoon, Senator Winfield, Representative Staffstrom, Senator Kissel, Representative Fishbein, and to all of the uh, distinguished members of the Judiciary Committee. I'm honored to appear before you uh, this afternoon, albeit virtually. I thank Governor Lamont for nominating me to the bench for another term. This is my fourth time appearing before this body seeking your approval to continue serving the people of the state of Connecticut for eight more years. I'm grateful for the 24 years that I have served as a Superior Court judge, as a senior judge, and now as a judge trial referee. I was appointed as a Superior Court judge in 1996. In uh, October of 2017, I became a senior judge and in October of 2018, I became a judge trial referee. My assignments have been in the judicial districts of Hartford, New London, Norwich, Waterbury, Bridgeport, New Haven, Willimantic, Milford, and outside of the geographical areas, they have been pre predominantly in uh, family and juvenile matters. Since I last appeared before you in January of 2013, I completed my assignment as a presiding judge of family in Bridgeport, and I was then assigned to the juvenile court in Waterbury in August of 2013. And I have continuously served in the uh, judicial district in Waterbury in the juvenile court as a presiding judge uh, until August of 2019. After I became a Judge trial referee, I, I continued to work four to five days a week until the court operations were dramatically reduced as a result of the COVID-19. And with your blessing, I look forward to continuing to serve the people of this state as soon as budgetary constraints permit and it's safe to do so. Hopefully we will return to normal operations later this year. And I'll be pleased to address any questions that you might have. Thank you, Judge. Uh, are there comments or questions from members of the committee? I see Representative Porter. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, congratulations on your renomination, Judge Turner. Um, just a really quick question, because I do have a special interest in juvenile matters. Um, could you just speak to um, what you've been able to bring to the table and how you've been able to intervene in the lives of these families to make a difference? Um, a factual difference in them having contact with this system um, in any, any way you desire. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I think what I've brought or contributed to the bench is a sense of um, fairness, a willingness to allow every party to have a fair and reasonable opportunity to not only appear, but be heard, to listen carefully to um, what it is that they're concerned with and their uh, arguments to fairly consider them. I think that um, I, I recognize that I am a servant. And so when people appear before me, I take the position that I'm there to help them. 
I'm there to adjudicate their cases. I'm not there to advocate for anyone. I'm there for the purpose of in the juvenile court trying to do the very best that the court system can do to address the problems that led to the parties having been brought before the court in the first instance. And those problems are numerous. And so I try and see to it that whatever services are identified that need to be provided to the family, including the child and the parents and others who are closely connected with the family are indeed put into place and that the persons working with the families have a demonstrate a ongoing genuine interest in trying to help them. In those situations where we can help a child or a family and the family is reunited, there's a great deal of satisfaction that I derive from that. Unfortunately, there are also times when the services that are provided are not fully taken advantage of and the, uh, it's not in the child's best interest to be reunited with the, with the family. And it eventually may lead to the child being placed in adoption. And when that occurs, uh, I'm also delighted to see that the child has had an opportunity to be placed with a family that will love the child, provide the child with a stable and safe place to live and with love and help the child have hope and the opportunity for a future that otherwise may not be made, made available to the child. Now, I think that when people appear before the, before the court and they see me, an African-American judge, and most of the uh, litigants that I see on both the delinquency side and on the child protection side um, are people of color. I think that gives them a sense of um, that they're going to be listened to, that they're not going to be prejudged and that they will be get a fair hearing and that they will be able to express themselves more freely and openly than they otherwise might feel that they would be able to do. Thank, thank you for that response. And just to piggyback off of that, through your lived experience, do you think that that has had, what kind of impact has that had you know, since you brought the fact that you are definitely a African-American man um, and we know that the justice system um, disproportionately impacts, you know, people of color, especially black people. Um, how has your lived experience contributed to you being to effectively, you know, do your job in a way that you may uh, see a difference in, in ways that other judges that don't have that lived experience adjudicate? Well, I derive a great deal of satisfaction when I hear that the litigants, no matter whether they're the plaintiff or the respondent, whether it's the child or the um, state's attorney, um, specifically state that they're glad to see Judge Turner sitting on the bench. That imparts to me that they believe that uh, appearing before me gives them an opportunity to be understood and to be heard and uh, they will be treated fairly and with respect. Now, that's not to say other judges don't do the same thing. Other judges do exactly the same thing. There's no question about that. But when, when I hear the litigants say to their attorneys and to probation officers and to case uh, services officers and others, is Judge Turner sitting on the bench? I want to appear before the judge that I derive a great deal of satisfaction out of that. And that makes me believe that they have a better sense of that the justice system is going to treat them well. Well, I, I thank you for that response. And, and, and it gives me a great sense of pride as well, just hearing you state that. And um, I thank you for your years of service and I wish you well um, and Godspeed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative. Are there comments or questions from other members of the committee? I do not, oh, Representative Palm. Thank you, Mr. Chair, <clears throat> very, very briefly. Judge, um, thank you very much for your words of compassion and um, equanimity. I just wanna say that as heartening as it is to your litigants, it's as disheartening to me 
that they need to feel that way. And, and I am I am sorry that that is the case. And I'm very grateful to you for your work on the bench. And Thank I wish you. there were more judges like you. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Palm. Are there other members of the committee? I do not see any. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon, Judge. Thank you, my pleasure. And uh, I do not see any, but uh, if there are members of the public who would like to testify, this would be the opportunity. This would be the opportunity. I do not see any. So uh, that being the case, I will uh, call uh, this uh, hearing to a close and uh, open the committee meeting. Um, we are, for the information of the members, we are going to uh, be going to caucuses. Uh, you should have, uh, if you're on the Democratic side, you should have received a, an email from uh, the committee clerk. Uh, and if you are on the Republican side, you should receive uh, email from uh, Representative Fishbein indicating what the link is for caucus. Um, I believe that, and, and uh, that Blanchard, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe that uh, when caucuses are over, we will return to this link. Is that correct or not? No, we will, we, we will go to the committee meeting link because that will give us the opportunity for the members that wish to. Oh, right, right. Pay. Right. Okay. And, and just because we've never done it like this before, did I get everything else right? <laughs> so uh, I would say to members to check the link uh, that should be in your email at this point. Uh, that's where the caucuses will uh, uh, take place and we will stand in recess until those caucuses have ended. <laughs>